to figure out whether the path that we take from point A to point B in a line integral actually gives us different values depending on how we get from point A to point B or whether they should all be the same value. Um, the first thing we need to look at are what are some properties that line integrals have that could help us to kind of think about that question about taking a path and maybe sort of cutting it up into pieces and figuring out how the line integrals on those pieces tell us something about the total line integral from one point to another point. So to get started, the first thing we observe about line integrals is that the if, if I have two paths that sort of connect up, so if I go from point A to point B and then from point B to point C, um, that the total line integral along that whole journey is just the sum of the integral from point A to point B added to the, uh, the integral from point B to point C. So that's what we mean when we say we're gonna add two curves together. So C1 plus C2 means that we're first gonna do the line integral along C1 and then we're gonna move from that point along the path C2. So that's what adding two curves, C1 plus C2, together means. Um, the other thing we can do with a curve is we can reverse its orientation. So instead of going from point A to point B, we can go from point B to point A instead. Um, we call that taking the opposite of a curve. So if I put a minus sign in front of the name of a curve, that's what I'm doing. I'm reversing the orientation of the curve. Uh, and when I reverse the orientation of a curve, the value of the path integral just reverses sign. Right? So this makes some intuitive sense, I think, right? That, for example, uh, in our original plane flying problem, if the work that was done by the wind on me in going along the path C1 from the origin out to here was positive, then if I had flown that route backwards, then instead of the wind working for me, it would be working against me because now my velocity vector would make an obtuse angle with the wind as I go backwards along this path. And so the path integral would have the opposite sign as it did when I was going the original direction. So if I reverse the orientation of a curve, I reverse the sign, S-I-G-N, of the value of the line integral. Uh, and so those are probably the most two, impo two most important properties uh, that line integrals have that can help us to get at the properties that we're trying to get at in the next few activities for us. And so the way we're gonna do this is to look at this vector field that's sketched right here, um, and then six different little path segments along here. Um, the first four of them making up this counterclockwise rectangle up here. So C1 is the southern side, C2 is the eastern side, C3 is the northern side, C4 is the western. And then I have a semicircular path C5, and this vertical path over here C6. And so once again, um, the first task is going to be to think about whether one of these path integrals is positive, negative, or zero. That's the C5, the semicircular one. Um, and then we want to start thinking about this complete circuit that we're taking over here. C1 followed by C2, followed by C3, followed by C4. So we're taking a, a complete loop. So I might call this a loop integral instead of a path integral. Um, and so if we're starting at the southwestern corner and then doing this rectangle counterclockwise, um, we want to figure out whether the path integral there is positive, negative, or zero, uh, and then try to order these path integrals from smallest to largest. So that means uh, from sort of most negative up to most positive uh, on the number line. Uh, so that's going to be the task uh, for this. And once again, we can do this without doing any explicit calculation, um, just by looking at the orientation of the vector field with respect to the path uh, at each point. So you figure it out here. Um, that <coughs> of the six different path integrals that are shown here, um, only one of them ends up being positive. That's the C4 integral, where we're clearly moving in the parallel direction to the vector field along C4. For all of the other examples, we get either zero in the case of the C1 and C3 paths, which are both perpendicular to the vector field at every stage, um, or negative. And so the hardest part, what you spent most of your time discussing, was how we thought that the negative value of the integral along C6, where we're moving anti-parallel exactly to the vector field along the way, except that the vector field arrows are pretty small uh, over here on the left-hand side of, uh, of the picture, uh, versus the C2 integral, which is a shorter path, but the vector field arrows are much longer out here than they are for the C6 path, um, versus the C5 path, which it looks like is moving in a acute angle to the vector field for its first half of its journey, and then an obtuse angle afterwards, except that the obtuse angle side has longer vectors than the acute angle side did. Uh, and so the negatives seem like they would overwhelm the positives for the C5 curve. Um, 
And so most important here is to is to separate the negative ones from the zeros from the positive. Um, and then how we assess the differences between the three different negative path integrals here. Um, some of that is subjective. I think if I were doing this, um, I would I would probably think that the C2 is bigger than the C6, larger negative value than the C6, um, only because it looks like the C6 path is twice as long as the C2 path, except that the vectors on the C2 path are more than twice as long as the vectors were on the C6 path. Um, and so when we take the dot product of uh, the vector field with the direction, um, that the magnitudes of the vector field are more than twice as long over here as they are in C6. So I'd expect that the value of the C2 integral is more negative than the value of the C6. Um, and for the C5, that would be kind of a toss-up, I think, on how it compares with the C6 and the C2. Um, but so that's that's the important bit. What's interesting about the total of this purple curve, if we take the C1, C2, C3, and C4 paths and we add them all together, uh, you correctly observed that that total is going to give us a negative value because the C1 and C3 make zero contribution at all, and the positive contribution being made by the C4 is not as large in value as the negative contribution that's being made over C2 uh, because the vector field arrows, again, are longer out in the C2 side than they are over in the C4 side. And so if I draw this rectangular path here, the amount of negative that I get on the right-hand side, on the C2 side of the path, uh, is larger than the amount of positive that I get over on the C4 side. Um, something that's interesting about this, though, and this is a teaser for something we're going to discover in a couple sections from now, is if I draw that same rectangle at different places in the xy plane, we end up getting the same result, right? that the total circulation is still ending up being a negative value. Um, because on the right-hand side of my rectangle, I get something that's more negative than the left-hand side is positive. Right? So it ends up being negative. Well, does that also happen if I move my rectangle over here? And the answer is yes, except that if I move my rectangle so that it straddles the y-axis like this, then both the right-hand side where I'm moving north and also the left-hand side where I'm moving south, that side is now also anti-parallel to the vector field. And so it's negative and then another negative, and so my total... Uh, circulation ends up being negative again. Same thing if I move this over here into, say, the second quadrant. Um, now it's the right-hand side that's ending up giving me a positive contribution, and the left-hand side is giving me a negative contribution. But again, the negative contribution is larger in value than the positive contribution is, and when we add them all together, the total circulation is still the same. So the total circulation here is about negative 2, uh, the value of my path integral. And what's interesting is, as I move this rectangle around to different places, the value of that total path integral, that total what we call circulation, is the same regardless of where I put this rectangle. It adds up to that same negative 2 value. So that's one interesting thing, is it doesn't seem to matter where I place this rectangle. The second interesting thing is that the value of this total circulation and the area of my rectangle seem like they are up to a sign exactly the same. My total circulation is about negative 2. The area of this rectangle that I drew on here is, is positive 2. And so the ratio of the circulation to the area is just negative 1, no matter where I put this rectangle. That's the kind of thing that a mathematician probably suspects is not a coincidence. And you would be correct. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. Um, but it's something that we will not, uh, we're not going to come to an understanding of why this should be the case uh, for a couple of sections yet, because we need to know how the circulation relates to the properties of this vector field, specifically the derivative properties of this vector field. And you might say that this ratio, negative 1, looks like it might have an obvious connection to the components 0 minus x of my vector field. It seems like it might have something to do with the partial derivative uh, with respect to x, because the partial derivative of that is negative 1 with respect to x. Um, so that's just a bit of a teaser uh, for where we're going to ultimately be able to get uh, when we marry the idea of circulation, which is an integral idea, to the idea of curl which is a derivative idea for vector fields. When those two things come together in something called Green's theorem, um, this is the fundamental theorem of calculus-like object that relates that integral perspective with that derivative perspective for vector fields and their circulations, we'll see why we should have expected um, that the total circulation is just going to be equal to negative 1 times the area of whatever is my closed curve along which I'm doing my circulating.